Assist States Program in Visual Impairments presents Tech Talk Number 7, How to Teach for Conceptual Understanding in Virtual Environments. Presented by Yu Ting Su, PhD, VI Program Coordinator and Assistant Professor. So tonight's Tech Talk is titled How to Teach for Conceptual Understanding in Virtual Environments. Um, I wanted to start our year off with this topic uh, because I think uh, myself, many of you guys, we are all teaching online. So we are all living and working and studying in virtual environments this year. Um, you know, I, I thought it was important to take a step back to talk about how to build students' conceptual understanding in virtual environments because I think too often we get so, I think, anxious about what tech or what devices our students need. Um, you know, we're scrambling to get devices for students and then we get the tech into the kids' hands and then it's all about how do we operate this stuff? Um, what are the buttons or what are the keyboard shortcuts? Um, what are the tutorials I need? And um, I would say that too often we jump right into teaching the tech without first making sure our students have good mental maps of what they're interacting with uh, using this technology. Um, so that's what tonight is about. And let me get my, my slides up for you guys. All right, you guys, here we go. So um, first off, we are going to start with a disclaimer, because although this is a tech talk, this is actually going to be a non-tech talk. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, right here we have this image of sand dunes and it's like moving sand that's being blown over these dunes. And I do feel that oftentimes when we talk about technology, it's kind of like shifting sand. You know, we think we have a good handle on technology, we think we know the devices that are out there, and then the technology updates. Or you might learn some technology really well and some devices really well, and then there's an update. Um, so technology, it is a little bit like shifting sand. Um, and our job is to figure out what's going to be that good skateboard or sandboard or whatever to allow us to flow as the sand moves. Um, in order to that, I, in order to do that, I think it's just as important for us to have a really good conceptual grounding of how to think about technology, just as our, our students need that conceptual foundation of how do I think about how to approach information in this virtual world. Okay, um, so a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is actually brainstorms, sandstorms or just storming in general, about um, what are the non-technical and non-technology oriented strategies that we actually need in order to help our students understand high tech, okay? Um, so we're gonna get a little bit interactive later, guys, so don't, uh, you know, don't get comfortable. Ooh. Okay, we have a little chime here. This presentation is broken up into three sections, and so with the chime, we are going to dive right into the first section. So, what is the vocabulary for blindness-specific virtual thingies? Um, thingies is not a technical word, you guys. I really just don't know how else to put it. Um, but what are these thingies that our students need to know that typically sighted students using technology really don't need to know. So there are a couple kind of VI specific thingies that we need to make sure that we understand so that we can adequately explain it to our students. And understanding that these are thingies that are really VI specific. I mean, these are the things that your, your general ed teacher or general technologist, IT person, AT person, they might not know what these things are. Um, unless they're really familiar with blindness technology, okay? So what are some of these virtual thingies? One is braille mode. Um, know that when you guys have your student hooked up with a braille display to their personal computing device, um, and a personal computing device meaning like a laptop, a desktop, um, a, a touchscreen tablet, um, a smartphone, 
sometimes these devices, you know, depending on what programs you're using, they actually have to be put into Braille mode um, so that when you've got the Braille display connected, the Braille will pop up um, correctly. Okay, so um, we'll, I'll talk more details about that on the next screen. Um, but another virtual thingy that we have to be aware of are virtual cursors. And virtual cursors are something you need to be aware of when any time a student is using a screen reader. So virtual cursors will work differently depending on which screen reader you're using. Um, and the idea of this presentation isn't to go too far into what's a virtual cursor, but to give you the vocabulary so that you know where you need to find more information to understand what these thingies are um, when you're troubleshooting these different types of technology and teaching your students how to troubleshoot, okay? And then the third thingy that we're gonna talk about are ear cons. So kind of like um, a couple slides ago when we went to this section, we heard that little chime. That's an example of an ear con. And these are things where it might be happening in the background of an app. Um, and these are things that maybe it becomes background noise, but they're meaningful sounds. So even for our students who are primarily auditory learners, or maybe they're just naturally really strong auditory learners, it still takes a little bit of, um, I think, conscientious instruction to teach our students how to really tune in their ears to the sounds that they're hearing. So it might be, you know, the screen reader is blabbing on about whatever information is on the screen. And in the beginning, it might be, oh, student, did you hear what that screen reader said? Or, oh, student, did you hear what keyboard shortcut that screen reader was hinting at? So I guess the visual, um, the visual parallel would be, you know, when you hover your computer mouse over a link or over a picture sometimes, and then there will be a little text label that pops up under your um, cursor that gives you additional information about maybe where that link takes you or what that picture description is. Um, those are sort of like visual tags that we get. And similarly, ear cons give that in auditory fashion. So just kind of extra clues of um, what information is available. So we'll go more into that in a minute too. And then finally, the last big virtual thingy um, are things like the virtual rotor, where there might be um, kind of like a hidden setting or hidden, hidden menu that you would only be able to access if you've got a screen reader turned on. So otherwise, for other people using the same type of device or same app, if they don't have the screen reader turned on, they would never discover these settings or these menus. Okay, so you can think of these kind of like Easter eggs um, that are, you know, gifts for people using a screen reader. Um, and of course, these are just the four things that I could think of as virtual thingies. I'm sure there are many more, but this is just, um, you know, definitely not an inclusive list, um, but just a couple examples of what some of these things are um, that our blind students might need to encounter that others don't. And by extension, um, teachers of blind, low vision, blind and low vision students might encounter that um, gen ed teachers might not. Ooh, okay, that was another ear con, guys. Hope you got it. So, first things first, we've got that support for braille displays and screen readers that I had mentioned. Um, we don't have time to go deep down into these, but just a couple examples. Um, if you've got a student working on a Chromebook, or let's say you have a student who wants to connect their Braille display in order to work with a Google Doc, know that you have to put that Chromebook or Google Docs in Braille mode. So you have to basically tell the device or tell the program, hey, I need some translation and support for Braille here. Um, don't ask me why, I don't know why it's Braille support isn't on by default. Um, that would be handy, wouldn't it? Um, but it is something you have to turn on. So um, Jess McDowell actually made a really nice post. Um, if you look on the Perkins Paths to Technology website and just do a Google search for Paths to Technology and the title, Chromebooks FAQs for TVIs. There's a really kind of like one-stop shop blog post all about all the different Chromebook accessibility settings um, that you can adjust for your blind and low vision students. Included in this post are links to um, the group Google 
you know, Chrome accessibility YouTube playlist. Um, there's also a thorough run through of all the different accessibility settings that are in Chromebooks, including where you can turn on Braille support. Okay, so this is a great um, resource for Chromebook and Chrome accessibility in general. Okay. Now on the right side of the screen, we've got a screenshot of the settings that pop up when you open the Desmos graphing calculator. Um, so the Desmos graphing calculator, it's uh, one of my most favorite products because, you know, although it was developed for mainstream use, so this was not a product that was developed for blind or low vision students, um, they did develop it for all students. So they really took into account accessibility of their program or of their tool really uh, for the very beginning and this includes braille support so if you just you know, do a google search for desmos graphing calculator you will get to the link to open the desmos online graphing calculator it's totally free everybody and anybody can use it but when you turn on desmos if you go to the top right corner um, you want to look for the the little wrench and um, when you click the wrench, it's basically like the settings and you'll see that you can actually choose your braille mode. So this is another example where if you want to be using Desmos with a student who is running a screen reader and or a braille display, of course we love having braille access all the time, um, this is where you would need to turn on your braille mode, okay? And it's nice because there's options for Nemeth and UEB. Um, and just so you guys know, you can also um, export graphs from Desmos to an embosser too, okay? So if you want more information about, you know, support for Braille or embossers using Desmos, again, just do that quick Google search and just search for Desmos accessibility, and it should be one of the very first links that pops up, okay? Um, and if you're curious to know more about Desmos, we will be circling back to Desmos later on tonight. Okay, our next thing um, is the voiceover rotor. And those of you guys who know me um, and have talked, uh, you know, been in my tech presentations or been lectured by me about technology, you know that I always really emphasize using generic terms to describe the features and types of technology a student needs. Well, here's the exception. Um, in this case, the voiceover rotor really is specific to using voiceover, which is the screen reader for Apple products, okay? So, um, you're going to encounter the voiceover rotor anytime you have a mobile touchscreen Apple device. So an iOS device, mobile Apple product, okay? With the voiceover rotor, this is something again that you would only access if voiceover is turned on. So you can't get to the voiceover rotor if the screen reader is not turned on, if voiceover is not on, okay? And so uh, this is an example of a specialized menu that you can only access when that you know, special tool is on, in this case, voiceover. Okay, so on the left, we've got, we've got a screenshot of the voiceover menu. Um, this is nested in the accessibility menu in the settings um, of your iOS devices. So this is the virtual quote unquote thingy, okay? Um, when you go into the voiceover menu, you'll actually see an option that says rotor. And this is where you can define what, I guess, options show up in your, vo in your voiceover rotor menu, okay? Um, and right here on the screenshot, you can actually see a visual representation of what the rotor is moving, um, moving through. And underneath the screenshot, there's actually a little graphic of a circle um, where the outline of the circle is in arrows and they're all pointing in a clockwise direction. And then you also see the outline of two fingers um, where you can imagine like the fingers would follow the, um, the direction of a circle moving clockwise. So in this photo, it might be like your thumb and forefinger um, being where you, you place the tips of the thumb and forefinger on the screen and you turn it in a clockwise manner. I like to make a peace sign and then put my fingertips on the screen and then turn my fingers. So it's really like you're turning a knob, that kind of motion. And this is exactly how students might need to conceptualize the motion in order to develop the fine motor skill to access this virtual menu, 
okay? Um, so on the screenshot, you can see that when the rotor is activated, it really is like turning a knob or turning a rotor. And as you turn it, it might like, um, it'll click through the different menus. So this is where you can maybe adjust the speaking rate. Um, if you wanna skip to different forms, here it's skipping through different words. Um, there's lots and lots of settings that you can choose to have on this rotor menu um, in um, the, the accessibility settings. So remember I had mentioned like, oh, it's kind of like asking your students to envision a knob. Well, what if your students in one of this houses or schools where there are no knobs? You know, we have, you know, fancy door handles now, or even just like a pocket door where there's no knob and it's just like a slot where you would slide the door over. And you might need to construct a, a knob. So yeah, I mean, maybe you just go to the hardware store and you buy a no doorknob, you know, that would be super low tech and very doable. Or even better, just go to the dollar store and find a cheapy little doorknob. Um, I love my, my Dollar Tree, that place is great. Um, but you know, if you wanted to get fancier, um, on the right side of the screen here, this is an example of how 3D printing can be um, really leverage to make these sorts of uh, customized objects for teaching. Um, so this is a 3D print um, made by Neil McKenzie. He's an AT specialist with Sonoma County Office of Education. And he does a lot of really cool 3D prints. Um, and I think it helps that he's actually the AT specialist for the Sonoma County VI program. Lucky them, by the way. Um, so he gets to be really creative about defining like what kind of teaching aids are needed specific to blind and low vision students. So in this case, he 3D printed um, a, a tactile rotor, basically. And this really just kind of mirrors what that virtual rotor um, does and, and, you know, is, and how it's used. But this is now offered as a tangible manipulative for students to actually put their fingers on the knob and to feel like the different clicks where the menu um, settings are. So if any of you guys really want to nerd out about 3D printing or see what else Neil has made, um, you can just do a Google search for Tinkercad. And this is a hot tip, you guys. Neil does not post his 3D prints under his real name. So you kind of have to know his pseudonym in order to find his stuff. And his pseudonym, and sorry, Neil, I'm giving away your, your identity here, um, but I know he doesn't mind. Um, it's Wonka Face. So just Google Tinkercad. T-I-N-K-E-R-C-A-D, and then Wonka Face is spelled W-O-N-K-A-F-A-C-E. And that should give you um, a whole listing of all of his 3D prints. Okay, and that should be our final EarCon for this section. Um, I wanted to leave this section um, with a great resource, and this is an example of how, you know, technology might seem like it's so new when there's all these new things that we have to do, but a lot of these concepts that we're talking about tonight are not new whatsoever. And um, I just wanted to reference Liz Barclay's book from 2011 called Learning to Listen, Listening to Learn. And this whole book, and uh, oh, Fran's got it up on her screen. She's showing us the cover. Thank you, Fran. I love that you have your bookshelf right behind you where you can pull books. Um, so there's this whole book talking about how our blind and low vision students need to learn how to listen so that they can use their listening skills to learn. Okay, so it might seem like listening comes naturally to our blind and low vision students, um, but just as I mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily come naturally um, because there are these, these little honing things that we might need to do. Um, so there's two blog posts I wanted to connect you guys to. The first one is how to teach your students to read at 600 words per minute. So this is basically helping your students um, increase their, their auditory efficiency. And this is a great post for both blind students who are completely non-visual learners and also our low vision students who have to deal with visual fatigue. So as, as much as we can like outsource information um, from the eyeballs to the ears to help reduce that visual fatigue, um, it can really help with our students' work efficiency and um, maximize their ability to keep up with information in the classroom. The second post is called Icons and Earcons. 
Um, and this is a nice post for anybody who wants to just read more about what are icons and what are ear cons, where can I find them, uh, when might I need to teach them. Um, so just some more food for thought there. All right, and let's move over. Okay, let's talk about structured discoveries for mental mapping, okay? Um, this is a big part of tonight's presentation, actually, because our students need to have really good mental maps of space in order to move independently and freely in their environment. And this is a basic orientation with Lady concept, you know, helping students develop their map of their physical environment so that they know, you know, how to navigate it, how to know where am I in space. And um, similarly, in virtual environments, um, we need to help our students develop those same kinds of mental maps. Um, so whether it's a physical environment or a virtual environment, it's helping our students know where am I in space and how can I get to where I want to go. Um, and I like using the word structured discoveries here. Um, I'm borrowing this from the National Federation of the Blind and their techniques for teaching students um, because a lot of this discovery process is helping students construct those mental maps for themselves because I think it's a lot more meaningful when um, students can construct their own maps because it becomes more concrete for them. And when students are involved in their mapping process and making their own maps, they can define those landmarks that are most meaningful for them, okay? So, what do students, students need to know about mental maps? When do students need to mental map? Um, I could think of at least three instances where students really benefit from having mental maps. Um, one is for screen reader navigation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Second is when you're introducing a student to an app, um, assuming that the app is accessible enough that they can even, you know, um, that it's responsive to a screen reader. I know that's a whole other issue of app accessibility, um, but sometimes apps are like, kind of partially accessible, minimally accessible, or they might be fully accessible, but they're just like a gigantic app, you know, with a lot of different information and components and elements. Um, and then finally, grids. And grids, um, we'll talk about that more um, in, a, in a minute too, about what it means to mental map in a grid. Um, you know, in the physical, aspect it's like you know when you look at an actual map you have grids to know where you are at a map um, but when we're working in virtual environments the idea of understanding what the grid is takes on a whole new meeting and actually opportunities for our students okay so let's go through a little bit more specific okay i told you guys in the very beginning my disclaimer was this is not a tech talk and this is our prime example of how we actually need non-tech and low-tech to teach technology, okay? So on this slide, um, it's a photo of a draftsman tool. And on the draftsman tool, there's um, a grid of boxes that are drawn out, um, tactile boxes, on the left side of the screen. So it's about maybe a three by eight kind of, um, grid of boxes and some of the boxes have an X in them and some of the boxes are just a square. And then there's a horizontal line kind of close to the bottom edge of the, of the draftsman tool. And underneath that horizontal line, um, beginning from the left, bottom left corner, we've got a little square that has like a plus sign in it. We've got a lollipop or could also be a magnifying glass. And then we've got a series of five squares and then in the bottom right corner, there's just a bunch of squiggles. And the title of the slide is, Use Tactile Maps to Build Mental Maps. Okay, so you guys, looking at this photo of this draftsman tool and the tactile graphic that's on it, what do you guys think this is a tactile graphic of? Anybody? This is Chanel. I am very into sports and I would almost say it's like strikes. 
Oh, no. Oh, that's so off though now that I'm like, where's the balls? Well, I guess the boxes without the crosses would be a ball. Okay. So uh, like a, a game? Yeah. Like a, 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 a yeah. Okay. And we could turn this into totally a baseball game. Much like. This is okay. Corinne. Is it the window screen? Right. Like the Windows homepage. Okay. What do you guys think of that? The, the Windows desktop. Yeah? Do you guys see that? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I love the idea of using the Draftsman as like a, a play, like a play board or like drawing out a game board for, um, you know, a field play or something or sports, uh, sports field and helping a student lay out like how the field is laid out. That is awesome. Um, and that is definitely another great application of this tactile graphic. Um, but yes, this is actually what I made to introduce a student to a PC and we worked a lot with this tactile graphic before we even turned on JAWS on the PC. So before the student even touched the PC, before we even opened it up, before he even heard JAWS, I drew, um, I made this tactile graphic of the desktop. So, you know, on his particular laptop, there were a bunch of icons on, on the desktop. And so I, you know, went through and actually counted how many icons they were. And I drew it out exactly like it was, you know, I mapped it exactly like how it was on the actual desktop. And then along the bottom, you can imagine there's like the start menu or the windows menu, you know, so that's a big, um, that's a big landmark on the desktop is how do I get to my start menu or windows menu. We've got the search bar. Okay, we've got maybe the task bar. So those are the five little um, squares in the bottom center of our tactile graphic. And then the squiggles I made, that's sort of like your utilities area, right? With, with your time and battery level, um, Wi-Fi connections. And it's just like, wow, all your utilities info right there. So I just kind of made the squiggles so that we could just talk about the utilities menu and what might be in there. Because remember, when you make a tactile graphic, you have to make decisions about what you include in the tactile graphic. So you really want to focus on what are the key landmarks on this tactile graphic and you're probably going to drop some of those little details so that you can minimize the tactile clutter on a tactile graphic. Okay, so some of those ideas always apply whenever you're making a tactile graphic. So in this case, you know, we were able to work on this tactile graphic. Um, I drew it, gave it to the student, and he was able to independently explore it at will. You know, he's got both hands and all his fingers all over it. He's feeling where all the boxes are laid out. And we're talking about, well, why are some of these boxes um, just a, a square? Why are they an X? So this is understanding how there might be like a placeholder on the desktop and where there are actually icons so that he can kind of understand um, like where the apps are laid out. So, um, you know, there's a placeholder in that, you know, third column, first row. There's a placeholder for an icon, but there's actually nothing there. So that as he's exploring with the screen reader, he's going to hear all these icons being read out loud. And he can kind of understand that they're actually scattered all over his desktop, okay? Um, and then, you know, when I, you know, I know that I'm going to teach him how to use the start menu, you know, we've got the Windows key on his keyboard. So that's a really big one, right? And of course, you know, students need ways to efficiently search for things. So I need to have that search bar there so we can talk about the search bar. And then the task bar, you know, when things are open, how do I know it's open and how do I get to back and forth programs? And then how do I access that utility menu? So I'm really just picking out the different elements that I know we're gonna go through and have to like teach with the screen reader. And by using this tactile graphic first, he's already got that mental map of how the desktop is laid out. So now when we open that laptop and we turn on JAWS, um, you know, first things first, we've got the Windows desktop, you know, we have to teach the, short, uh, the keyboard shortcut key or the command, I mean, for getting to the Windows desktop. So that's gonna be one of our first commands. Well, actually our very first command is always with the screen reader is always teaching the be quiet key. Um, so we always want the student to be able to control um, how the technology is giving them information so that students always should feel in control of their technology. 
Um, and at this point, once I hand over that technology to the student, I am all hands off. I'm using, you know, just my non-visual descriptive language. Um, you know, the student kind of already has a general orientation of the laptop. So now we can turn on that screen reader and I can help him refine how he's listening to the screen reader to know where he is. So now he can hear the screen reader and if he wants to, he can reach over to, to the tactile graphic to, to remind himself of where he is in this virtual space. And remember that the, the screen readers have linear navigation. So, you know, if he's on the desktop and he's hitting tab, it's just gonna read all the icons as if it's in a very long line. Um, but we know that the icons are actually spread out on this desktop, okay? So he can start getting the idea that even though he's hearing the information in a linear fashion, and it sounds like it's just one single row of icons, it's actually going through like this gridded layout of the icons. So now the student can start understanding, okay, I'm hearing this in a linear way, but it's actually moving in a spatial way across the desktop, okay? Um, okay, so let's move on to other types of tactile graphics that might help give students this map, like this concrete map of virtual spaces. Um, this has become one of my favorite go-to resources. Um, this is another kind of one-stop shop um, of items from Neil McKenzie. And the, the URL is a little bit difficult to remember. So I usually just take this URL and I bookmark it. Um, so it's sites.google.com forward slash s c o e dot org forward slash s c o e v s forward slash v i dash resources um, and i'll give you guys a, a minute just to write down this url if you like and s c o e stands for sonoma county office of education Okay, so on this website, um, again, it's really a one-stop shop of all the different tactile teaching aids that Neil has created. So these files are specifically created to be used with a pee-off machine or a pictures in a flash, also known as a swell machine. And so this is just a, a small screenshot of some of the things that are available. Um, this top left thing is of Google Drive. So, you know, it's um, a pretty complicated tactile graphic, actually, that's beautifully done that shows just the most important elements of Google Drive. So you could create this on your pee-off or swell machine and, again, have the student kind of interact with it. You can talk about all the different elements that are on Google Drive. And this way, when you then go to the computer and explore the Google Drive layout with a screen reader, the student already has somewhat of a mental map of what's happening um, in, on this website and what information is available there so they know what's available, okay? It's kind of like um, general O&M concepts anywhere. You kind of have to have an idea of where you're going in order to get there. Um, this is kind of like that idea with um, providing the, the tactile graphics of these maps of the virtual environment. Um, moving along in this top row, the second one, this is a pee off of a Google slide. So for students who need to use a screen reader to go through a Google slide presentation or even a PowerPoint presentation, um, this gives a general layout of, um, you know, where's the, the menu bar, where's my slide so sorter, and where's my, the main real estate for the slide. So this way, when you're skipping around with a screen reader, um, you have shared language um, to orient the student to where they are on a slide. And then the final one that I really like a lot um, is this, the Zoom interface. Um, and so, you know, it's important, I think, that when you give students an orientation to a virtual environment, such as, you know, the Zoom screen, that you also talk about what the icons look like, because these are shared visual references that the teacher might use. And, you know, who knows, your student might be able to guide their sighted friends to say, oh yeah, the mute button, it's your microphone, or you can use this keyboard shortcut. And this is a great um, area where our students, with their savviness and knowing the keyboard shortcuts to access these features for, you know, turning the mic on and off, 
or turning the video off and on or jumping into the chat box. These are really great keyboard shortcuts that I think a lot of teachers and typically sighted students would appreciate too. Um, so, you know, especially with our students being in this shared environment with typically sighted peers, um, it's great that there are these opportunities for them to be seen as equal partners with their with their um, peers, and also to be take to take on these positions of like training and maximizing everybody else's efficiency too. Um, and then other things that are on this website are there's a little twister board, um, there's a tactile graphic of um, a, a mixer app, and there's a couple different Jeopardy boards. <clears throat> so Neil's got great stuff on here. Okay, so I've used the word virtual landmarks and anchor points a little bit. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about what I mean when I talk about giving students anchor points, okay? <clears throat> so for screen readers and text, and when using a screen reader to navigate text, you know, it's important that our students know that when they've got a block of text, hopefully if it's an accessible document <coughs> or accessible website, that there are headings that have been formatted to organize the text. So some of the landmarks might be using headings to jump from one section of a document to another, okay? So these are sort of like your, your goal posts through a, um, a document. So Chanel trying to use some of sports reference for the sports people in the room. Um, and then reading order is also of importance because, um, you know, a really good website will have the headings um, to mark the different sections of a website, but then it'll also read in order. So it's in like a, a reading order that makes sense versus a website that's not accessible, you might hit tab to, to see where the cursor lands to check the reading order. And as you hit tab, that cursor or the links kind of like jump around and you can tell that the reading order is totally out of whack, like it's not reading in order. This becomes a really big consideration, especially when you're, you've got students who are navigating math in a digital format. So on the left side of the slide, we've got a screenshot of um, equations in a, in a mixed fraction format. So in the numerator position, there's three plus two X. And then in the denominator position, there's three minus two X. And the whole fraction equals three. So for anybody who knows a little bit about math, you know that reading order is very important here. Like it would be very important for a student to know that they have to do the numerator part first. So three plus two X, and then divide the whole thing by three minus two X. So when you're thinking about reading order with math, um, it's also important to think about, well, how is the screen reader reading this math? And um, has this been formatted so that the student can jump from the numerator and read that and understand its numerator to then jump to the denominator and understand that everything that be, that's being read is also in the denominator. So um, I think that before a student can really understand this in the digital way, virtually, um, they need to see this on hard copy braille. Um, they need to still feel how this is laid out and understand the spatial layout of math. Um, so this is just another plug that even though technology is great, we can't skip over these very important foundational lessons using hard copy embossed materials and tactile materials, okay? Um, now, on the right of the screen, it's just a little bit about app layouts and how to figure out where your anchor points are in an app. So this is a screenshot of Seesaw. Um, it's the Seesaw app on iOS. I know that you know, there's Seesaw is not a perfect app. And one example is that, you know, when you turn on VoiceOver and you've got the Seesaw app, it's a little messy um, how the how VoiceOver interacts with Seesaw. And, you know, when you turn it on, the screen reader automatically, you know, it kind of goes through the feed on the left side, the activities feed. Um, but if you can see on the screenshot, you can actually tell that the the app is kind of split screen. Like you've got the activity feed on the left side, and then you've got a vertical bar with a bright green plus sign on it. And then to the right of that vertical bar, you have, you know, what class you're in and um, how do I get to my messages or my inbox and sort of those like kind of more navigational areas of the app. Um, so what I ended up doing with my student is we explored um, kind of like the, 
what the screen reader would read as it goes through the apps. But the landmark was when he heard, um, you know, Miss M's fourth grade class, that was his anchor point to know that, okay, when I hear Miss M's fourth grade class, I now know that I'm in that little sidebar area of Seesaw. I now know that I'm out of the activity feed. So, you know, that's sort of like, okay, if I'm hearing Miss M's fourth grade class, if I'm hearing journal or activities or inbox or skills or blog, I know that I'm somewhere around the right side of the app. And I know that if I want to get back into my activity feeds, I might need to just tap on the left side of the screen or swipe until I hear before Miss M's fourth grade class. Okay. So again, remembering that screen reader navigation is very linear. The screen reader is going to read everything through the activities feed and then everything starting with Miss M's class. And it sounds like one long kind of thread. Um, but at least the student can have this anchor point of what's the information before Miss M's class and what information comes afterwards to give some orientation of where am I in this whole blob of screen reader reading stuff to me, okay? Okay, um, I really love talking about the numpad and um, I kind of just fell into talking about the numpad this summer with, uh, with one of my students um, because he was very new to using voiceover on an iPad and don't ask me why, but the touch screen button on his iPad just never worked. And so he always ended up having to use a numpad. And I could tell by the way he was kind of randomly dragging his finger around that he didn't have a good mental map of the numpad. So for us, like we can see the number pad, we can see how the numbers are laid out. And so we could quickly even close our eyes and very quickly use a number pad to type. And you know, accountants use this a lot too with the, the number pad. So for the student, I kind of wanted to take a step back with him and go through what is a numpad? What's the number pad and how are the numbers laid out? And why, is it, why does it matter? So um, of course, I needed to put the screen away and put the technology away and go no tech to have the student construct his own numpad. So let's hear from you guys. What are three different ideas you would have on how you would ask a student to make his own number pad. How would you guys do it? This is Allison. Yeah. Um, how about you use sticky notes? And if you um, emboss the sticky note or have the student get out their slate and let's put numbers on those sticky notes and then you can move them around. Oh my gosh, Allison, it's like you read my mind. That's actually exactly what I did. Awesome. <laughs> so great. Um, and the reason why I like that was because he also had a goal where he was working on slate and stylus skills. So we got to wrap, uh, wrap in like lots of different skills. And then mom got the brilliant idea of let's put the sticky notes on a clipboard. So now it's like we've got a mobile surface moving around. Okay. Awesome. Any other ideas for how you guys would have your students make a number pad? They did. Um, I, I would put little um, tiles with the braille numbers and with the um, Velcro and do it on the, the um, uh, like a all-in-one board Great. or some kind of a board like that. Great. I love bringing in the magnetic or Velcro and being able to move the pieces and it's a little bit more uh, reusable than, than sticky notes, huh? This is Kim. What about the same thing but with Legos? Ooh, great. Another good one. And I bet that if we went around the room, everybody would come up with more strategies for how you could help a student make their own tactile number pad. And so think about really getting students to construct these their own maps, okay? because the student will remember it so much more deeply when they have to go through the labor of, you know, making their own number pad and like actually moving the numbers in place. So they're essentially developing 
their spatial literacy here when they're putting things you can talk about rows and columns you've got the grid you're talking about how the five is your anchor point in the number pad because the number five usually has a little bumpy on it so then you can talk about well when when do you see a number pad um, it's when you check out you know at a register you know in the future you might use it at an atm machine to get cash out so students encounter number pads in a lot of different ways. Um, in this particular context, um, I decided to generalize the student's understanding of the number pad to understand grid navigation. So on this slide, there's a screenshot of the I Hear You app, and you is spelled E-W-E, -E, like the sheep. Um, and so on this app, it's a three by four grid where you've got one animal on each little square. And when you tap the little square, it's almost like a card um, that, you know, um, it's, it makes the animal sound. And so if we look here and we look back at the number pad, you know, it's basically a three by four layout, right guys? With one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then symbols, zero, backspace. So, we went to the I Hear You app and I said, well, kid, which animal is in the five position? Because remember, five is our anchor point. And he went through and you know, explored um, by dragging his finger across the different icons. And he said, oh, it's, it's the cricket. Great. Well, what if you're at the cricket and you want to get to the horse? How would you have to move your finger to get from the cricket to the horse? So then it's like, oh, one left, two down. Or what's another way? Oh, I could go two down and then one left. And, you know, we didn't talk about coding. This kid isn't technically learning coding yet, but these are also early precursor skills to coding concepts of how do you move from one position to a next using left, right, um, go up, go down. And this is also moving up, down, left, right in a virtual environment. Okay, so we've got our last section um, of the Tech Talk. Um, and we're, I, I wanted to leave you guys thinking about how do I help students construct meaningful, meaningful representations um, to develop their spatial literacy? And I, I really wanna emphasize the word spatial literacy because you know, so far we've talked a lot about tactile graphics. Of course, it's understanding that students need to have good tactile skills to explore tactile graphics. But tactile graphics are really there to convey spatial information. And so when you make tactile graphics, it's very important to remember that you're actually making representations for spatial information. So it's not just translating visual information into a tactile format, it's translating visual information for spatial understanding, okay? So, one example um, of how to how students need to understand how things are laid out in space um, is with sonification. So sonification is a pretty big deal technology that is becoming more and more well integrated. And I think this is a really great example of a newer technology where you might be tempted to just dive in and say, great, we're going to use sonification today. But unless you go and take a step back to help students understand what they're hearing or how sounds are laid out on a graph, they're not really gonna understand what they're hearing. So what is sonification? Let's start with that, okay? Um, I've got a little video here queued up for you guys. And this is um, a graph of a sine wave um, intersecting with a parabola. And this video is an example uh, from Desmos and they use it to demo their accessibility features. So I'm just gonna hit play here and we'll get a sample of what sonification sounds like. On audio trace by pressing option T. Audio trace on. I can now use the right and left arrows to navigate along the curve while the screen reader calls out the coordinates. Intercept at X, zero, Y, one. X, 0 0.2, Y, 0 0.9801, X, 0 0.4, Y, 0 0.9211. Press tab to jump from one point of interest to another. Intersection at X, 1.0141, Y, 0 0.5284, 0 at X, pi over 2, Y, 0. Extremum at X, pi, Y. 
So think about if you're having a student explore these intersection points, they, they really need to have that tactile graphic right next to them, right? So they can understand where they are in space while the screen reader's reading, right? Okay, let me keep playing this. Minus one. And finally, press H to trace automatically along the curve. Playing graph. It's worth. Okay, so I mean, it seems to make sense for us visually because we can watch the cursor as it moves along the line. And as we're seeing it go follow the path of the line up and down, we can hear the tone of it going up and down. So then you might think, well, how do I teach a student how to really understand how to take in this information in a different way? Because they don't have the visual cues for how it's moving, right? Um, so how do we teach this? Let's see. Next slide. At Desmo. Okay. So we've got to build the foundation first. So um, when I first introduced my student to sonification, we were on tactile graphs for weeks before I even turned on sonification on Desmos on the computer. So what we did at first was um, on the left side of the screen, there's a picture of just a piece of paper and I put it on the sensational blackboard and I used a ballpoint pen to very quickly draw an X line and a Y line. And I said, okay, so this horizontal line, that's our X axis. We've got our Y axis vertical line. They're meeting in the corner and that's our zero, zero. So that zero, zero is gonna be our anchor point, right? Meaning we always start the graph from zero, zero. So what I did was, you know, this is, you know, on a back patio, um, socially distanced away from the student. Um, I had him explore the tactile graph and I said, I want you to start your finger at zero, zero. So where X and Y meet. So we've got that anchor point. And now I just want you to, with both hands, trace that line. And it's a straight line going straight up. But as you're tracing the line, I want you to listen to how I'm making the sound effect for the line. And so as he's moving his hands, and the way sonification works is as a line moves from the left to the right side of the x-axis, um, if you're using headphones or like um, you know, stereo um, sound, you'll actually hear the sound go from left to right speaker. And as you move up on the y-axis, the tone goes up. So Ready? He's moving his hands on the graph, and I'm, I'm kind of quietly stepping to the very left side of the deck, uh, left from his orientation. And as he moves his hands up, I just go, and I'm literally moving my body so that he can hear how the sound is traveling from left to right. And I'm using the tone of my voice to, to show the tone. So I did it, and it's like, okay, your turn you show me how this line sounds. And so, you know, the student gets to get up and like really be literally full body experience, full body engaged in making the sound an effect. So then um, this photo on the right is a photo of a curve line. So again, the line starts at zero, zero, because we're using that as our anchor point. And the line curves up sharply, and then it dips a little bit, and then it curves all the way up. And so you can imagine when he's feeling the line, I'm again sonifying it, like, and he actually said, Miss Ting, you're like the, I, I'm like the Miss Ting remote control. And I said, yes, exactly, you are. <laughs> and so, you know, he's, he goes, ooh. So I really have fun with this, and you can do it um, anytime your student is um, checking out the line shape or, you know, a line graph. Um, APH has a really great, um, one of those flip books where you can flip to match um, match like three segments of a line. And so I've also done this with the APH line books um, where as a student is checking out different shapes of lines, I'm literally just sonifying it with my, with my voice. So um, in this, you know, you're, I'm using this tactic so that we're using again, these physical, concrete, tangible manipulatives. So he's got the mental map of how the sound matches the graph. So then when we popped back onto Desmos and he heard the ooh, ooh, ooh the, sign, the sign graph, he could hear it and from that sound make his mental map of what the graph probably looks or in his case feels like, okay? 
So that's like kind of the ultimate closing the circle when you can take that student um, into the virtual environment and they've got such a good mental map that they have a really good interpretation of the information they're getting in that digital environment. Okay. Oh my gosh, we are at time, you guys. I can't believe we made it. Um, so uh, for those of you watching online, um, I post a lot about this stuff on Twitter and Facebook. So I'm on Facebook with my full name, Yu Ting Su, Y-U-E-T-I-N-G-S-I-U. I'm on Twitter at TVI underscore Ting. And um, you guys should also follow our program because our program is on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. And a lot of our fantastic students in the program often post their own tutorial videos on our social media outlets. Um, so we're constantly creating new content. Um, we've got these tech talks once every couple of months. Um, and so you can find the VI program on social media at VI program SFSU. And that's also where you'll find our fabulous students work too. Video editing by Monica Kulenai, VI program manager.